Hello and welcome to The Conversation Weekly. This week, we're looking at the business practices of pharmaceutical companies through the lens of the pandemic. We start with where drug companies were before the arrival of COVID and how they fared financially over the last couple of years. Some company has been very successful and for some others, they have lost a, a lot of money. Then we're taking a look at the tension between profit and equitable access to vaccines and other life-saving drugs. The status quo is deeply flawed. This is an indication about the asymmetries between government and private sector. I'm Dan Reno in San Francisco. And I'm Gemma Ware, this week in Paris. You're listening to The Conversation Weekly, the world explained by experts. Remind me now, Dan, which COVID vaccine did you get? So for my first two shots, I got the Pfizer here in San Francisco. And then I actually just got my booster a couple weeks ago and I got the Moderna. I figured broad-based coverage couldn't hurt. Mix and match. I like it. Yeah. What about you, Gemma? I got Pfizer for both jabs, but I know my mom got AstraZeneca and I know another couple of people who got Moderna too. It's kind of funny. A couple years ago, I wouldn't have known the names of any of these drug companies. And I don't think most people knew any of them. If a pharmaceutical company was in the news, it was usually for bad reasons. Yeah. And now the pandemic's given these drug companies, the ones that won the race to make the COVID vaccine, some pretty amazing free advertising. All this free advertising certainly seems to be paying off. A survey conducted in February 2021 in the US found that 62% of the people that responded rated the pharmaceutical industry positively. But you know, it wasn't always like that, Dan. The pharmaceutical industry's reputation was at rock bottom. And, and we know that from the Gallup poll that was taken just weeks before the COVID epidemic really hit. This is Ray Moynihan. He's talking about a Gallup poll of Americans' views about business done in August 2019. It put the pharmaceutical industry bottom out of 25 different sectors. Ray is an assistant professor at Bond University in Australia and a former investigative journalist. I spent a long time as a journalist investigating the pharmaceutical industry and their marketing behaviours. And uh, more recently, as an academic, I've been working on the problem of too much medicine and overdiagnosis and the overuse of treatments. The reputation of pharmaceutical companies was low because their marketing behaviour was just increasingly seen as out of control their influence over doctors, their influence over medical science, the exorbitant prices they were charging, the criminal behaviour that they kept getting found out about. But before we got into that, I asked Ray to take me back and tell us where the pharmaceutical industry first began. The modern pharmaceutical industry really starts to be formed in the 19th century, particularly in Europe, but also in the United States. And then large companies start to emerge. People might know the name of Bayer. Bayer was one of the early drug giants, if you will, in in the 19th century. The financial success of pharmaceutical companies didn't really kick off until the development of patent protections in the 1950s in the US. This, This thing called patents becomes increasingly important, and that is the legal right for a company to have an exclusive right to market a particular product. The industry realized fairly soon that that it was a recipe for profitability and success. So a company could discover, launch a new drug and have exclusive right to, to promote that and sell that for a certain amount of time, guaranteeing profits. In addition, pharmaceutical companies also won the right to market drugs to doctors and in the US directly to consumers via television and radio advertising. And so those laws that came in the latter part of the 20th century in the United States allowing direct-to-consumer advertising really fueled the success and the profitability of the industry in a massive way. And eventually, at the end of the 20th century, in those dark ages before Facebook and Google, before big tech, big pharma was among the most profitable industries. Were there any particular drugs that the industry grew as a result of the new treatments that came in that really helped the industry grow in in the latter part of the 20th century? 
Yeah, well, I think it's important to note while we're speaking critically about this industry that, of course, it produces incredibly valuable drugs and from time to time produces genuine breakthroughs, things like antibiotics, which comes out in the you know early to middle of the 20th century, which just changed the world. The HIV drugs that came out in response to the HIV AIDS epidemic, again, just miraculous scientific endeavours that allowed whole generations of people who would have died prematurely to continue their lives. Cancer drugs are often extending the lives of millions of people. But Ray says that some of these drugs have a darker side too. We know that we've overused antibiotics to such an extent that we have this terrible antibiotic resistance now. And while some companies have marketed drugs aggressively, they haven't always priced them fairly. As a result, not everybody has been able to access medicines in the same way. The HIV drugs were priced so high in many places the people who needed them most couldn't get them. And cancer drugs, similarly, the pricing of those has become very controversial and for very small incremental gains in effectiveness, uh, some companies have been charging huge extra costs. So it seems that the pricing is a really core part of the way the industry works and the way it's been constructed and grown in order to make a profit. But it's also been what the industry has been very criticised for, hasn't it? That's right. And people will know like the antidepressants, like Prozac, for example, very profitable drugs. The statins, Lipitor, the cholesterol drugs, hugely profitable for for Pfizer uh, in recent decades. So there there are some drugs that that have become uh, extremely profitable. And there were some famous examples in the United States where price increases just went through the roof. Famously, the EpiPen which people may know, the EpiPen had a, a something like a 400% increase in the price. And, and some people rely on that drug for their life. Ray says pharmaceutical companies have traditionally justified these prices by arguing that they depend on their profits to make new medicines. The industry will always defend its prices by saying that it needs those profits to plough back into research and development to keep coming up with the next lifesaver. And to a certain extent, that argument is valid. But he says the problem is that some of the breakthroughs have come through taxpayer-funded science. Some of the research and development that industry uses and capitalises on and exploits has come out of the public sector anyway. There's a huge question mark over whether or not the taxpayer is getting a good return on its investment. Uh, A lot of that profit is going into marketing to expand profits rather than into exploring uh, drugs for neglected diseases, exploring drugs that are never going to be profitable because they are needed by the world's poorest, things like that. To make matters worse, some of the big pharmaceutical companies are also among the big tax avoiders. This issue of whether or not drug companies have paid their fair share of tax became another very big and controversial issue for the industry in the lead up to the pandemic and potentially was another reason that the reputation was on the rocks. In Australia, there were actually Senate hearings and it was being suggested that some of the companies might have been paying as little as one cent in the dollar, one percent rates of tax. According to an Australian government report which was presented during the hearing in 2015, the nine largest global pharmaceutical companies operating in Australia had notched up 8 billion Australian dollars, that's around 6 billion US dollars, in sales in Australia in 2014. They'd received 3.5 billion Australian dollars in subsidies from the Australian taxpayer. Meanwhile, they had collectively paid just 85 million Australian dollars in income taxes. And then the the big NGO Oxfam put out a report some years later, and their research suggested that, that drug companies were cheating the world out of billions of dollars of taxpayer revenue. Ray says another issue, and something he's been spending a lot of time researching, is the way drug companies work behind the scenes to influence medical science. Its influence is enormous. From the cradle to the grave, um, prescribing doctors all over the world, many of them are deeply influenced directly through the sponsorship of medical education, 
indirectly through industry-linked researchers and doctors writing clinical guidelines, through pharmaceutical company funding of, of medical journals, through constant visits from drug representatives to doctors' surgeries, and now increasingly through industry funding of patient groups, advocacy groups that appear to be independent but can be often very reliant on industry money. He says it's no wonder that the industry's image has been so tarnished and that it's drawn public scrutiny. In fact, in 2009, the National Academies of Science in the United States put out a a landmark report on conflicts of interest in medical research, medical education and medical practice. And they just said that while collaboration between companies and researchers was critical to finding new cures, the extent of industry influence was just jeopardizing the very project of science. It was undermining the legitimacy of medical education and importantly was also undermining public trust. The reason why we're concerned about this is that it can mean that people end up getting drugs they don't need. It can mean that that conditions and diseases are, are overhyped and overpromoted, you know, and often the, the marketing can even bleed into criminal behavior. And there are numerous cases of major legal action being taken in the US setting, but certainly in many jurisdictions around the world that have actually investigated and successfully prosecuted criminal and civil violations by some of the world's biggest drug companies. The biggest healthcare fraud settlement in history happened in 2009. Patients' health and lives are put at risk, and those who cause that risk must be held accountable. When Pfizer was forced to pay a 2.3 billion US dollar fine for illegal promotion, false and misleading claims about drug safety, and for paying kickbacks to doctors in the US. A couple of years later in 2013, Johnson & Johnson paid out 2.2 billion US dollars in civil and criminal fines for putting profit over patients' health. Well, pharmaceutical giant Johnson & Johnson is revolving one of the biggest healthcare fraud cases in US history. The company was charged with illegally promoting powerful antipsychotic drugs, overstating benefits and playing down dangerous side effects, including stroke. And in July this year, a group of drug companies was ordered to pay a total of 26 billion US dollars. Four drugs companies in the United States have agreed to pay 26 billion dollars to settle claims that they fueled an opioid addiction crisis. Ray says there are signs that governments are starting to take more preventative measures to try and curb the power of pharmaceutical companies. In places like Norway, you've had the Norwegian Doctors Association saying, we'll no longer give our doctors credit if they go along to a drug company funded educational event. You've had Italy setting up new taxes so that they will tax drug company marketing budgets in Italy and they'll spend that money on publicly funded research, which has different priorities from privately funded research. And he says some medical journals are also attempting to move to greater independence to try and limit the influence of drug companies. So you have seen over the last 10 to 15 years, a lot of civil society, a lot of medical professionals and governments just trying to start addressing this problem of undue influence. And indeed, on the eve of the pandemic, myself and and a whole lot of others with the British Medical Journal, the BMJ, launched a campaign called Pathways, which was about Pathways to Independence. It was about a campaign explicitly addressing this problem of commercial influence, distorting healthcare, and, and trying to explicitly say, it's time we started winding some of this back. So very small steps have been taken, but certainly there's a long way to go. You wrote in a recent piece for the conversation that you think it's fanciful to imagine that the pandemic will um, magically end some of the misleading marketing and and price gouging practices that you've just described. So what kind of reform do you think then needs to happen post-pandemic to move forward? Look, I think it would be fanciful to imagine that the, the history The practices, the marketing behavior, the unethical and sometimes criminal behavior, it would be fanciful to imagine that that is all going to disappear overnight. And I think as we move into the post pandemic recovery, you know, thanks in part to the role of the vaccines that industry has produced, the need to reform this industry and the way it's managed uh, and the way drugs are evaluated and marketed is as important as ever. 
For a pharma industry riding high today, that's a pretty damning list of things they were doing just on the eve of the pandemic. It is. And as Ray says, these are complicated and long running issues around the way the industry works. And Ray was pretty honest that he didn't think the pandemic would actually change much. Well, if anything's going to change the way a company behaves, it's going to be money. So next, we wanted to figure out just how much profit pharma companies have made during the pandemic. And to help answer that question, I called up Jerome Cabi. My name is Jérôme Cavi. I'm professor of corporate finance at Sorbonne Business School in Paris, France. I am also the general delegate of the French Foundation for Management Education, FNEJ. I asked Jérôme to give me the big picture of how pharmaceutical companies have been doing financially during the pandemic. The big picture is nuance. Some company has been very successful, uh, no impact on most of the companies, and for some others, they have lost a, a lot of money. Only a handful of pharmaceutical companies have successfully produced a vaccine for coronavirus. So the situation is very different from one company to another. And Jerome says it's been a particularly profitable period for companies purely focused on vaccine biotechnology. For instance, the US company Moderna, this company has been created in 2010. And until 2021, they have never registered any profit. In 2020, they have lost $745 million dollars. But they are expected to record $11 billion profit in 2021. So for, for them, the pandemic is very profitable. Another biotech company, Germany's BioNTech, partnered with Pfizer to make its vaccine. They have been created in 2008 and they have experienced their first profit in 2020, but only 15, 1, 5 million euro. But they are expecting for 2021, 10 billion euro profit. 10 billion euros is a little over 11 billion US dollars. Some vaccine manufacturers agreed not to sell their vaccines for profit initially. AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson, they have announced from the beginning that they won't charge any margin on their vaccine. They are only charging costs uh, and no impact on their profit and loss account. In November, AstraZeneca did actually begin selling its vaccine for profit, but said it would continue to sell it on a not-for-profit basis in developing countries. Johnson & Johnson has also recently indicated it will soon start selling its vaccine at a profit too. But Jerome says other companies which have failed to produce a successful coronavirus vaccine or been behind in the race have not fared so well. We are always focusing on the successful company, which are making a lot of profit, but we are at the same time, forgotten the company that have invested in a lot of money to develop either new drugs or new vaccine. And then they have not been successful and they are registering a high loss. Jerome has been looking at the numbers. He's working on an analysis for the conversation, which will be published very soon, on just how profitable the world's biggest pharmaceutical companies are. So the purpose was only to assess the level of their profit, is there any abnormal profit compared to over traditional company in over industry? His analysis focuses on the top 10 pharmaceutical companies based on their turnover for prescription drugs, which includes vaccines. It's where you are supposed to make the highest profit because you are investing a lot of money to develop new uh, medicine, new drugs based on your research. And if you are obtaining a successful drug, you are then negotiating with social security system a price that could be able to cover your cost, especially your R&D cost, and to make some profit. Okay, so who are these 10 companies? Well, there are five American ones, Abvi. Bristol Mayers, Johnson & Johnson, Merck and Pfizer, two Swiss ones, Novartis and Roche, the British group GlaxoSmithKline, the French company Sanofi, and Japanese company Takeda. The analysis Jerome did looked at the results for these top 10 companies in 2020. That's the last year with the most complete financial information. He was struck by how much they'd been investing in research and development, or R&D. So compared to other industries or sectors, it's really huge. And among the top 10 of those companies that developed successful vaccines, clearly invested more in R&D too. It's 22% for Johnson & Johnson and 25% for Pfizer. Meaning on average, when you are producing a vaccine, you should invest about at least 20% of your revenues. 
in R&D. For the main part of his analysis, Jerome drilled down into a couple of different metrics to analyse how well these top 10 companies were doing. We're going to focus on three of them. The first was trying to understand their overall financial performance. You've got different indicators to assess the financial performance of a company. I have chosen one of the most well-known ratio, which is EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization, divided by revenues. It means at the end of the day, when you have paid all your operational costs, what are your earnings? This measure of financial performance is expressed as a ratio, and generally, the higher that ratio, the better. So he found that for the top 10 pharma groups in 2020, this ratio varied between 28% and 48%. Which is impressive uh, compared to other industry. For instance, if we compare to the same performance for S&P 500 company, the 500 biggest company listed in the US, the, the average is 18%. The second metric Jerome looked at was profitability. For this, he chose to look at the company's return on assets ratio. Now, this gives an indicator of how well a company is using the assets it has to make profits. Again, the higher, the better. So we divide the net income by the total assets invested in the company and their performance are quite different. Jerome says the Japanese company Takeda, for example, had a return on assets ratio for 2020 of 2.1, but it was 15% for the Swiss company Roche. Now, for comparison, the average for the top 500 listed companies in the US was 2.2%. On average, more profitable than the listed peers, but the difference is not as huge as the one we seen for the financial performance. The third metric Jerome looked at for these 10 companies was their valuation. And the ratio he chose was the value of the company's shares divided by its EBITDA. So, for instance, if you obtain 10, it means that the value of a company is 10 times its EBITDA. This is a metric used in mergers and acquisitions. It helps to assess the price an investor might want to pay per share for a company. The big pharma company, they've got rather uh, reasonable uh, valuation because, uh, again, Takeda has the lowest one with 8.13 and Johnson & Johnson, the highest one, with about 14 times its uh, EBITDA, 1.4. Now, let's compare that again to the S&P 500, where the average is around 16.45. So it means that it's still a good investment, but in terms of valuation of a pharmaceutical company is on average lower compared to uh, their peers. So take this all together, and Jerome says that for the first year of the pandemic, at least, it was kind of business as usual for these big pharmaceutical companies. I had a look also to 2021 result and forecast for this company in terms of profitability. And for instance, among the 10 companies, the results are stable for the return on asset, with one exception, Pfizer. The return on asset of Pfizer for 2021 should be about the double compared to the one of 2020. Last month, Pfizer said it expected to bring in 36 billion US dollars in revenues for its COVID vaccine in 2021. That's only a little bit under the 41.9 billion in revenues it made for the whole of its business in 2020. I asked Jerome if we're able to read anything yet into whether the industry has changed the way it does business during the pandemic. No, I'm not expecting from a pure financial perspective any uh, big change in the futures in terms of business model for pharmaceutical uh, companies. Personally, I'm thankful that this company has developed so quickly such uh, vaccine. I'm not sure if we, this could have been possible without this kind of company. And this company, they are seeking profit. They are a capitalist company. That's their job. And basically, it works. It's the same kind of perspective for every company in every industry. The issue here is, is drugs of the pharmaceutical uh, industry a common good industry? If you are not seeking for profit, do you develop new drugs and, and vaccines? Jerome's analysis will be published next week on The Conversation as part of a global series on the pharmaceutical industry. Do check it out. Okay, so we've got the money situation and it's safe to say the pharma companies aren't generally hurting for cash. No, they're doing pretty well. And for vaccine manufacturers, that's only going to get better in the coming years. 
But what allowed them to be in a position to reap these economic benefits? It's certainly not just private money that flows into pharmaceutical companies through their investors, but especially during the pandemic, a lot of public money too. And that's brought up some big questions about ownership fundamentally of the vaccines and especially what that means for access. A good way to understand this issue is to take a look at an ongoing legal battle in the U.S. This is between the U.S. government National Institutes of Health and the drug maker Moderna. The U.S. government invested nearly $10 billion in taxpayer money into the development of Moderna's COVID vaccine. Now the government and Moderna are in a bitter dispute over who deserves credit for inventing the central component of the company's coronavirus vaccine. The problem we're currently uh, facing is that the U.S. government has, in different ways, contributed to the development of the Moderna vaccine. This is Anna Santos Rushman. She's an assistant professor at the Center for Health Law Studies at St. Louis University School of Law in Missouri in the U.S. For the past 10 years or so, I've been working uh, on health law-related and intellectual property-related aspects of vaccine development and distribution, allocation, etc. So you recently just wrote an article for The Conversation explaining specifically what's going on with Moderna and some of its current legal battles with the U.S. government over vaccine patents. Give me the story here. What's special about Moderna is that after the previous pandemic in 2009, the swine flu pandemic, the U.S. government really was strategically involved with Moderna, a company that up until the COVID-19 pandemic had not brought a single product to market, but they were doing really interesting work in this mRNA technology areas. Just as a reminder, using mRNA for a vaccine is the new technology that underpins the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines against COVID-19. So the government partnered with Moderna, and it did a couple of things. It provided funding for R&D, but it also actually provided support in the form of scientists performing research on what would become what we now call, perhaps unfairly, the Moderna vaccine. And that's what's at stake right now. And the dispute now between the U.S. government and Moderna is that Moderna applied for a very important patent covering the core of the mRNA technology and did not name the government scientists that collaborated with the company as co-inventors. What's the downstream effect of this kind of non-naming? In a patent application, you are required by law to list all the inventors. And according to scientific norms, if there's enough collaboration from one of the the parties, you name them as co-inventors. Now, the consequence of failing to do this is actually that the patent application might fail, which Moderna will want to be very careful uh, about. While patents are an important way for measuring scientific reputation, for example, in this case, there's a lot more at stake, particularly who has control over making and selling the vaccine. Assume the application matures into a patent, right? So if the patent issues and it's attached only to Moderna, that means that the government through the patent system will have no control over the outcome of the product covered by the patent. Imagine owning a house. If I owned a house by myself, I get to decide who comes in for a party. I get to decide who I rent it out to, and I can decide not to rent it out to anybody, just keep it you know, to myself. It's not the perfect analogy, but it's this is the most important short-term consequence, is that if there is co-ownership, but it's not acknowledged legally, then through the patent and through the intellectual property relationship, the government cannot ultimately control licensure of the vaccine. They cannot say, hey, this is being distributed in ways that are not equitable, and we want to have a saying in how this happens. Moderna, as it's doing now with with the government dispute, is saying we are the sole controllers of this product. The outcome of a patent rights issue like this is especially relevant during the pandemic. For example, if the U.S. government had control over the quote-unquote Moderna vaccine, it could, in theory, allow other manufacturers to produce vaccines using the technology and the secret sauce, if you will. It could also direct vaccine doses wherever it likes, including to lower-income countries that have received fewer vaccines so far. For now, the lawsuit is still ongoing, but the outcome still hangs in the balance. Anna also pointed out that technically, governments could force vaccine manufacturers like Moderna to waive patents and make their vaccines publicly accessible for a period of time if they wanted to. Right now, there's a discussion of a waiver that would enable compulsory licensing to occur and that would presumably apply to the intellectual property of vaccines. 
What Anna is referring to here is the campaign to temporarily waive intellectual property right protection on coronavirus vaccines. The campaign to do just that was led by India and South Africa in March 2021 and is being backed by the World Health Organization on the grounds that it would reduce the barriers to countries producing their own vaccines. But the European Union, the UK, and Switzerland have opposed the waiver. Negotiations have been deadlocked. The waiver would not extinguish the right to control your intellectual property, but would say you actually, for a period of uh, of time, so the duration of the pandemic or for whatever the duration of the waiver might be, you will not be able to stop others from manufacturing the vaccine. Technically, the way that um, happens is that the waiver makes sure that the traditional consequences for what we would normally see as a violation of intellectual property do not take place. There is an alternative to the patent waiver route. However, companies could just decide to make drugs more widely available on their own initiative. The drug manufacturers Merck and Pfizer have both done this. In recent weeks, both companies announced the development of new antiviral oral treatments for COVID-19, which they say will be licensed voluntarily to prospective manufacturers in low- and middle-income nations. The licensing agreement grants that the two companies will not receive royalties, making it cheaper to produce these drugs. Anna commended Merck's and Pfizer's decision. In many ways, this is a product that's needed to address the same type of problem. Um, There is scarcity of a product that we need to curb this pandemic. The difference here is what these companies have done is to say, I can control the the fate of the product and I'm going to license it out. So voluntarily, I don't need the government or anybody else to coerce me. So um, it's something that a lot of people, myself included, uh, have welcomed um, this idea that they will allow other companies to be manufacturing and distributing these pills so that we can escalate um, production. But there's a big difference between antiviral pills like this and COVID vaccines. An mRNA vaccine is much harder to reverse engineer than a pill. The production is just a lot more complicated. She likened it to making a bicycle versus making a fighter jet. It is a very real threat. And we've seen that, for instance, in the past in the context of drugs needed during the peak of HIV AIDS crisis, for instance. Um, There was the threat of compulsory licensing and suddenly companies started playing ball, right? With vaccines, you can threaten that. So we have the legal pathway. But in my opinion, and many other people share in this view, it's meaningless in the sense that it will not get us more product. Now, it might have other meanings and other uh, virtues, right? The types of pressure, the court of public opinion, geopolitics and the like. But it will not get you more product, which is what we all want at this point. This is all a reminder that power over a public good, in this case vaccines and medication, often ultimately still lies within the private sector, even when taxpayers have contributed, in this case greatly, to its funding. I I think that the status quo is deeply flawed. This is an indication about the asymmetries between government and uh, private sector power and negotiations really have not evolved that much in the recent history of the pharmaceutical industry and of how we've brought drugs to and vaccines to to patients in, in need. We do need these collaborations. The problem is that saying that we need the other parties to play ball does not mean that the reward they reap from those collaborations should be completely in check and fettered. We're not talking about not rewarding them for the effort they put into this because they do. And they put resources and they fail often and that's a risk they take. And I don't think that has to be or should be discounted. But I also don't think that means that these more absolute forms of control are good from any perspective. At the heart of all these issues is the question of how to improve access to drugs and vaccines for everyone who needs them around the world. And so to help suggest a solution, I called up a philosopher at Binghamton University in the US. My name is Nicole Hassoun. I'm a professor of philosophy at Binghamton University. And I also direct the Global Health Impact Project, which is an initiative to advocate for um, greater access to essential health technologies in part by measuring the health impacts of those technologies. Nicole says that access to medication will be much fairer if control over how to distribute them is held by the general public rather than private companies. 
Prior to the pandemic, pharmaceutical companies would generally tend to fund the development of a vaccine with their own investment. Traditionally, you know, there's a long uh, timeline to getting a vaccine approved, and that um, involves clinical trials and phase one, phase two, phase three testing. Pharmaceutical companies would pay for the development of products themselves. But to speed up the process of vaccine development in the pandemic, governments decided to provide a ton of public funding in the late stages of the vaccine process. Most of the funding for product development now has come from governments and philanthropic organizations. Um, basically, we're funding late stage product development, the expansion of manufacturing, and the federal government in the United States uh, in 2020, they invested $11 billion in that late stage vaccine development and, and expanding capacity. And so, you know, we had Operation Warp Speed, for instance, where we would have these agreements with companies to purchase the technologies. So we said, if you come up with a vaccine, we'll pay you now. Uh, we'll commit to purchasing it in the future. And so that kind of thing was happening with all the different companies. And so that's, you know, that's one of the things that's changed. And it makes sense, right? We certainly wanted to give these companies money to produce a vaccine. So why is the funding shift a problem? I think when we pay for things and we take on all the financial risk associated with developing new vaccines, we're paying them to do something, but then they get to keep the profits. I, I think that's not reasonable. I think if we're going to pay for so much for a new drug development and put in all this funding up front, you know, what if we pay for it, we should own it. I should say also a lot of that new technology development isn't even done by pharma companies. They get a third of their inputs from universities. Nicole suggested one way to do this might be to attach conditions around public funding for drug development. So one idea I propose is vesting licenses for new technologies in um, an international organization if it's providing the funding for the technological development. This could be organized at an international level. I think we, we really should have this basic principle that if we pay for it internationally, and there's a lot of pandemic financing that's going to be forthcoming, then we should own that technology and the knowledge and the things that we need to actually make it and then commit together to equitable access. One way to do this could be through something like a pandemic treaty, which is currently actually under discussion at the World Health Organization. The countries can get together and say, OK, we want to create um, a new agreement and the new agreement needs funding for a new research development. And we can either earmark some proportion of already agreed upon funds for pandemic preparedness and response or create a new pool for funds. And that could come from, uh, you know, a global tax. It could be, you know, a global transaction tax or a tech tax. Such a fund could be governed by a body such as the World Health Organization. It would define the products that it needed, such as a drug to treat a rare disease, and then provide funding to pharmaceutical companies or NGOs or universities to develop that product. So they say there's a major global health threat. There's not enough incentive to develop a technology that we really need. If you can do it, then you um, can get a prize. And they specify the conditions of you know providing that funding. And so pharma Medical companies might say, OK, well, that looks like a pretty good deal. You know, I get a new uh, vaccine for dengue or something, a, a huge pandemic risk. I don't know uh, how much market there'll be if there'll ever be a, a bigger pandemic. Um, but it's reasonable to accept that and, and hand over the technology now, because right now, most of the people affected by dengue are relatively poor. I can't make all that money. And then the technology and the rights to it are held by the international community that paid for that technology. So, you know, right now it's this really weird and complicated process where pharmaceutical companies enter into all kinds of agreements with governments at different price points. It's not very transparent. But if there's one organization that's saying, OK, we have this technology and we're going to distribute it in this way, basically at cost in low in middle income countries, maybe with enough of a profit in, in richer countries that we can recoup those investment costs and then use those investment profits to invest in manufacturing and distribution and basic health systems that we need to actually get shots in arms, we'll be better prepared for the next pandemic. If you're interested in reading more about the pharmaceutical industry, search out the conversation series by following the links in the show notes. Now, sticking with COVID, to end this week's episode, we've got some recommended reading about the new Omicron variant from Ozia Patel, digital editor for The Conversation in South Africa. Hello, 
My name is Josier Patel, and I'm the digital editor based in Johannesburg. The first story I've chosen is called the hunt for coronavirus variants, how the new one was found, and what we know so far. The article is important because a bunch of experts in South Africa share what they know and what they don't about the new Omicron variant. Research is underway to understand how transmissible it is and whether it can evade vaccines. The scientists have found that the virus has a number of mutations which are concerning. In the end, the scientists strongly recommend universal vaccination as the best tool to fight COVID-19. The lead author is Professor Wolfgang Preiser, the head at the Division of Medical Virology, Stellenbosch University in South Africa. The next article I recommend you read is from Professor Shapir Mahdi, Dean at the Faculty of Health Sciences and Professor of Vaccinology at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. In the wake of the new variant, his article outlines how restrictions and bans are not the best way to go about dealing with it. Instead, he says we should learn to live with and cope with the virus. Vaccination is key for all and boosters are key for the immunocompromised. I hope you find these articles useful. Thanks for listening. Oz Patel there in Johannesburg, South Africa. That's it for this week. Thanks to all the academics who've spoken to us for this episode. And thanks to the conversation editors, Fabrice Rousselot, Lionel Caviccioli, Emily Schwartz-Greco, Brian Keogh, Fron Jackson-Webb and Stephen Kahn, and to Alice Mason for our social media promotion. Find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio, Instagram at theconversation.com, or email us at podcast at theconversation.com. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. Just click the link in the show notes. If you're enjoying The Conversation Weekly, please leave a rating or review wherever podcast apps allow you to. And tell your friends and family about the show, too, if you liked us. The Conversation Weekly is co-produced by Mend Marawani and me, Gemma Ware, with sound design by Eloise Stevens. Our theme music is by Nita Sal. I'm Dan Marino. See you all next week.